Hey, y'all, and thanks for having us. I'm Tim, and this is my brother, Matt. And we do over a 1,000 varieties of Japanese maples. Uh, we grew up with this. Our grandmother started growing Japanese maples in the 1950s. We grew up getting off, her, uh, off the school bus at her house. She had two broken hips. And we got our passion for it from her. And then my father on the other side of the family started growing Japanese maples in the 1970s before he ever met my mom. So it's just naturally in our blood. And we have Japanese maples on both sides. So Tim got the microphone. They said, hey, we're going to have you just talk. Normally the microphone's used to turn me down a little bit. So if you can't hear me, let me know in the back, but generally not too much of a problem. I'm Matt, and again, that's my brother Tim. We do MrMaple.com. We do over 1,500 different varieties of Japanese maple, so we're kind of crazy hoarders when it comes to this stuff. We've kind of got a little bit of everything going on in our nursery. Azaleas, Dawn Redwoods, Dogwoods, Conifers, a little bit of everything, but maples are definitely what we're known for. And uh, they asked us today to speak about care of Japanese maples, and I was going to change it to why you should care about Japanese maples, but we're going to talk about care for Japanese maples as well. Uh, in this photo here, this is Nakakomoto weeping. This is the national treasure of Japan. It's a tree that's over uh, 400 years old. The stakes that are holding up some of these branches are over 200 years old. And this is one of the oldest cultivars of Japanese maples, and it sits at a temple in Japan, although it's not much in cultivation until uh, we were able to acquire it after it came across from Japan. And this, we're actually fil filming an episode of Nipponi Ikita, which is everyone wants to go to Japan on Tokyo TV, where they were filming our reactions to Japanese maples in the wild and nurseries and things like that. And we were just happened to be getting to go film this on our off day. We, got, we said, you're close near the national treasure, Nakakomoto Weeping. So this is a pretty legendary plant. Yeah, really cool to see this one. Uh, it was quite spectacular. Nakata-san there in the front uh, actually took us around uh, in, in the native habitat there in Japan, and we kind of studied how Japanese maples were growing in their native habitat. So he took us back, and then we went back to his nursery, and we recreated a garden that kind of represented how we looked at the trees growing there natively. So it was a really cool experience. It was a huge learning experience, and he was so gracious on our day off. They were actually filming B-roll at Nakata-san's nursery, and we said, we got to go see this tree. And we're already kind of crazy. They're like, don't lose these guys. So our translator... He was tasked with don't lose these two crazy American guys who want to go everywhere. And so he was babysitting us. So we were like, hey, you just gave us a translator for everywhere we want to go. So we drug him out there and he translated a lot of the cool things going on here. Uh, but really cool to see this tree. Some estimates had it over 600 years old, conservatively a 400 year old Japanese maple there in the landscape. So if you give them the proper care, hey, they can live quite a while. I always like to show people, hey, in 400 years, this could look just like this. So just, just be patient. So true, so true. But we do do a daily YouTube show. It's the Mr. Maple Show on YouTube. We're on the Facebook. We've got the Mr. Maple Friends group. And then our weekly podcast, you can find us on any of your favorite podcast platforms. We do top lists, like our top variegated Japanese maples. We'll do like a top 20 or top 50 list. And then we'll also go through and talk a whole podcast just on watering Japanese maples. So we, we do it all whenever it comes to it, from care to the Extreme Collector, fun, uh, exciting podcast as well. So check us out on your podcast and on YouTube. So we're going to answer questions at the end because I'm sure we'll have a ton of questions. But if we don't get to your question, I almost promise you we made a video on it. We made one every day for the last two years. So there's a lot of videos out there and a lot of really good kind of how-to content. We want to make it as easy as possible and give people as much confidence in gardening with Japanese maples as possible. I mean, this is what we're passionate about, and we just want it to be easy. I mean, there's a lot of simple things you can avoid and mistakes you can avoid that we'll go through in this. But, yeah, our podcast is, uh, if, you, if you don't get enough of us today, we got it out there. Don't worry. You can find us again. And the photo here is actually the Kyoto Botanical Garden behind us. Um, Matt and I, we, we've made multiple trips to Japan, and we plan on making more trips. Knock on wood, the TV show that filmed with us is coming to visit us this fall. Now, they came back during COVID and shot a, like, where are they now kind of thing. Because our episode was real popular. Around 12 million people saw it in Japan. Kind of crazy. Uh, didn't really, we don't really ship any trees to Japan, so we didn't make any money off the deal. But it was really cool to get that kind of notoriety and get to be on that show. Well, it was a really popular episode. And during COVID, they came back and filmed kind of like a where are they now update to our episodes. So they filmed, like, 
I don't know, an additional 30 minutes that they re-aired it with. And they're like, oh, look, now he's got two kids and Tim's married. And no, oh, they've done this and this. And so they've already done that. So knock on wood, when they come back, maybe they'll take us back to Japan. So we'll see. Because <laughs> they've scheduled a return visit. We're like, well, they already did the follow-up. And we do have an episode you can go check out on YouTube as well. It aired on PBS on Grown or Greener World with Joe Lample. You can just type in Mr. Maple, uh, Grown or Greener World, and that episode can pull up, and you can watch that on YouTube as well. Um, we're also featured on In the Garden with Bryce Lane, which is also online as well. It's been on North Carolina PBS. Uh, when it comes to Japanese maples, one of the number one questions we get is how to plant a Japanese maple. And there's a lot of different uh, ways you can do this, but what we're going to talk about is what works for us and what not to do. Because that's the key things when you're planting a Japanese maple is making sure that you're doing it right. This is actually our gardens. This is Maplewood Gardens uh, in East Flat Rock, North Carolina. And we've got over 300 Japanese maples on the ground there. It's our parents' home. Um, my dad started growing Japanese maples and he wouldn't plant many of them out in the landscape. And he would sell off his biggest one and keep the smallest one. And we took him to a few of his customers' gardens and said, <laughs> Dad, let's get rid of the grass. <laughs> let's plant that. And that's essentially what we did here with many of the Japanese maples all around his yard. Yeah, we took him to some different gardens in Asheville. And we're like, this is a tree you grafted in 92. And this is what it would look like. This is probably probably around early 2000s. And he's like, man, I've got to start planting more. And so we, we definitely have a lot in the ground. We do procure this so that the different fall colors and spring colors kind of accentuate each other. We also plant it so that there's dwarf trees that have a little bit more room long term in, in accompaniment. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But one thing we do there is kind of plan for color accents and, and long term spacing. Now, there's some things that are utilitarian, too, with planting Japanese maples. One is you got to make sure you have good drainage. Drainage is the key with Japanese maples if we're going to talk about containers later or in the ground. Drainage is like the one thing that's really not negotiable. People are like, I've got a super swampy spot. What Japanese maple should I put in there? And I, my suggestion is a Dawn Redwood or Bald, Bald Cypress. Cypress. Like, it's not a Japanese maple. It's really just not going to ever work. You're going to have to find ways to increase that drainage. And ways you can do that is you can actually build up the beds around those areas. Um, it, it's, it sounds very uh, comical to many people who are gardeners, but many gardeners, that is the issue that we see. We, they send us photos and they say, what's going wrong here with my Japanese maple? And you look. And there, it's, in a, it's in a boggy or a wet area, and you're like, I think it's holding a little too much water. You can build up the area a little bit around that area for a Japanese maple, give it good drainage, and that tree is going to do a lot better. You can, too little water is one of those things with Japanese maples that often won't kill it, but too much water, that can, that can be an issue very, very quickly. And whenever you're planting it, make sure it's got good drainage. Raise it up a little bit. Don't plant it deep because it's going to sink down when you plant it. Often what happens is someone will get like a 10 gallon from us or a three gallon, they'll put it out in the landscape and they'll set it about level and it'll sink down. And then they come back and add mulch on top of that. And what we're doing there is we're smothering the roots. And so that's one of the biggest issues we see with Japanese maples, especially with planting. And, excuse me, but whenever it comes to the soils with planting, there's a wide array of soils that you can use. Red clay actually has really good benefits in it. I don't know if you all have a lot of red clay, but it has good benefits as long as you can make sure you have good drainage. It's got a lot of micronutrients and a lot of things in there. Um, but you need to mend the soil and make sure that you've got good drainage. And that's, that's always what is key. Build it up higher if you need to. Um, we had, on our very first uh, podcast, we had Steve Bender from Southern Living Magazine. You feel another grumpy gardener. He's, he's a riot. He's... And he, he was simply saying all about, you know, even red clay. I mean, that's what we have in Western North Carolina. Red clay is a fantastic thing to plant in as long as you have good drainage. And you can add some soil amendments to really give some extra airflow to red clay. But that's one of the key things with Japanese maples. And that's really the main thing with planting Japanese maples, I would say, is good drainage. So uh, along with that depth, all of our Japanese maples that have names to them. So... Think of it almost like breeds of dogs. So if you see you know, a waterfall here or a Lillian's Jewel, those are known varieties that are grafted. One thing you never wanna do is bury that graft. So you wanna even maintain your mulch level below that graft. If you're burying it in the mulch or the graft below the soil, I've had nurserymen say, you can just bury that graft if you don't wanna look at it and you know, put it under the soil and it'll be gone. Well, you're essentially making that tree re-root above the graft. So it's gonna be much slower, much weaker grower long-term. 
And some cultivars don't root. So essentially it's a death sentence if it's something that very, isn't very likely to root because eventually that, that root system that's grafted to is gonna die out being buried too deep and that new rooted cutting might not take. So make sure you don't plant them too deep and never bury the graft. The reason we graft is because it makes a more durable and more viable tree long term. Uh, many of your lace leaves especially would be really, really wimpy you know, if they were on their own roots. So a lot of times when you find a new lace leaf selection from seed, it has to be grafted right away to kind of, you know, keep those traits going forward. So kind of think of it like breeds of dogs with grafts. I mean, that's what the cultivars are. I often let people know my brother and I are brothers, but we don't look exactly alike. And the same thing is true with Japanese maples. So if you take seeds from the parent plant, some are going to look like that, but some might look completely different. And by grafting, we kind of know we're getting a Great Dane and not a Chihuahua. If we're wanting to put a Chihuahua here, we're not putting, you know, something that's completely different. And whenever it comes to different Japanese maple cultivars, there's some that, like Matt said, it would be a death wish by putting that extra mulch on top of it. Basically, Japanese maples have shallow, non-invasive roots. And that's true with bigger, mature Japanese maples as well. A younger Japanese maple, it doesn't put out a lot of roots that are messed up your sidewalks, your rock walls. That's one of the reasons, one of the reasons why they're so great for containers. But that also means that you have to be very careful when choosing companion plants that are planting next to your Japanese maples. We don't want to put something like um, the old timey ditch lilies around the base of a Japanese maple or, di or day lilies. A big culprit could be like a, a really uh, heavy grass that has a ton of roots below or even Japanese yews. I've seen you know Japanese maples in a planter at a garden center with a Japanese yew and a giant ornamental grass beside it and you're like wow that's just a matter of time because that yew's gonna win, the grass is gonna lose, and the maple's got no shot in this, in this category. So make sure you're not giving it too much root competition beside it. Certainly there are a lot of great accompaniment plants you can put around it, but look at what's not invasive on that root system for sure. Maples have a very non-invasive root system. So if you're giving it too much root competition, they're probably gonna lose. They're not gonna push through sidewalks, they're not gonna push you know, through uh, rock walls and things like that. It's one of their benefits is what's going on below the soil but we gotta be conscious not to give them too much competition. What we like to do is we like to choose a ground cover, something like a creeping Jenny or a, a sedum, a smaller sedum. And that can actually add to color contrast with the tree as well. So you can take a red Japanese maple, plant a yellow sedum underneath it or a creeping Jenny, and you get a really good color contrast between the red and the yellow. And it make, gives it a nice eye popping effect, but that ground cover also serves some extra added benefits because during the hot part of the summer, that will take the brunt of the heat where the Japanese maple's roots will be a little bit cooler underneath. We carpet this entire garden with sedums and it's kind of our redneck version of Kyoto Moss Gardens because we've got all that nice stuff going on there and it's not as hard to maintain as all that, that, that moss. We don't have as much moisture going on. A lot of these trees are actually in full sun, but with the mulch and the, uh, the sedums, they're actually getting a good bit of you know soil retention, moisture retention. They're not drying out so quickly. And there's so many different ways to do soil amendments. And in every area, there's different people who've done it for years, and that's the people to talk to and say, hey, do you do soil amendments in, in our soil? What do you do? Because they're going to have your best uh, way at doing it specifically in your area. But what we're covering here is what to do and what not to do. That, that's the main things, because there's so many different ways you can grow Japanese maples in the different soils. Coming up next, we've got container growing. And again, number one on the priority list for this one, good drainage. Yeah, we, we, we talk a lot about container gardening. It's so popular with Japanese maples for so many reasons. You know, a lot of collectors, <clears throat> these guys maybe, you get a lot of plants, you can't get everything in the ground. You gotta get some trees and containers. I, I don't know if you're really a collector unless you got trees and pots that you don't know where they're putting them. I don't know if that counts or not, but you're really not a plant hoarder unless you got a couple in the back, you're not sure where they're going yet. If all your trees are in holes, I think you still got a lot of work to do. But uh, Japanese maples and containers is a great way to do it because that's, they're gonna work essentially really well outdoors year round, as long as you're giving them the key elements they need. Now I always let people know, putting a Japanese maple in a planter typically takes it down one zone. Now it's not an exact science, especially for the West Coast, but we list Japanese maples as zones five through nine on the East Coast, because it almost works perfectly. The zones really rate them by how cold they get. Uh, and so there's really no exact measurement. I had a guy in our, our place last week in California, and he's in zone 10 California, puts everything in containers, never gets below like 40, never gets above like 80. So all those trees are in full sun and planters. So it doesn't really work for how hot it gets, but in general zones five through nine for Japanese maples in the ground, and then zone six through nine in containers. So take it up one zone for that cold tolerance. 
If you're in zone five, which none of y'all are here, but you're gonna need to keep them in the ground. One of the biggest mistakes I see people make is taking your trees indoors and giving them too much protection in those winter months in containers when they don't need it. We're, we're actually in zone 6B where we're at in Hendersonville, North Carolina, East Flat Rock, North Carolina. Our nursery is unheated all winter. And the only time we heat is if we're active and in leaf before we start leafing out. Like we leaf out and then it starts getting cold again. That's when we start, you know, watching out the temperatures. But as long as we're dormant, we let those things enjoy that, that, that dormancy period, let them rest, and then let them wake up in a normal period. So what you don't want to do in containers is bring your tree inside, give it a fault spring, give it that, you know, that early leaf out time, and then get it back out too soon. That's one of the most dangerous things you can do. And I would encourage most people, especially uh, in that zone six and above, you know, leave the container outside all year. Make sure you got good drainage, protect the planter, but leave it outside. Now, container growing is something that requires care. We have to think about when we put a tree in a container or a plant in a container, we're keeping it from getting water naturally and setting out roots. And we, we have to really take extra care because there's not as much nutrients in that pot. When it comes to this, remember I talked about drainage. Make sure that it flows through the pot. That's essential when it comes to this. We don't want to put those, those little pots underneath your pot, those little dishes that hold water. That will cause Phytophthora root rot on a Japanese maple. It may work for other plants, but water sitting on the dish, especially during the summer months when you have that high heat. It's the saucer of death. Yeah. <laughs> you it, don't want that hanging out below. It's definitely going to cause a lot of issues for your Japanese maple. The saucer is basically a way of trying to say, hey, I don't want to water you as much. Let me put something underneath you. And with Japanese maples, you, you can't do that. You have to just water consistently and not put a dish underneath it to hold water underneath it. Make sure that planter has good drainage. People send me pictures of a pot and they'll say, hey, this doesn't have any holes. What would you do? Pour some cereal and some milk in it because you got a bowl. You don't got a pot. You got to have some good drainage there. It's not ever going to work for a Japanese maple unless you got drainage. So make sure that drainage is going through there. Now, uh, the key there, uh, my mom will even take an extra step like in the garden. So I, I swear my mom and my, my wife love for me just to move things around. So I got all these big planters full of trees and I'm constantly moving them around in mom's garden for. She actually, under the mulch, puts bricks down. And so there's a hollow space underneath the tree that you don't see when you walk into her garden. And it's just an area to increase that drainage so the pot's not suctioning to the ground. And that helps a lot long term because in the winter months it's draining all the way through, you're less likely to break your, you know, your more ornamental pots aren't getting shattered because they're holding water and freezing and things like that. But it's also helping that tree because that water is retaining, it's got an area to go down and completely wash through. Japanese maples they love to go in search of water. They don't want to be standing in water, but they love to get watered thoroughly and then dry out completely and then get watered thoroughly and then dry out completely. So you want to create that kind of situation. Now, what I also recommend doing, if you're growing a Japanese maple in a container, check that container about every four to six years. Now, I typically go out in February when I'm doing this. I'll pull the tree up in February. You can see the root ball. You can see, make sure none of the roots have grown through those drain holes. I've seen that happen where somebody says, I've got a great drain hole. I don't know what's happening. And, you know, they've got a 10 year old tree in the pot, but the trees completely put roots through the pot. So there's no water getting out now and it's saturating way faster than they thought. So look for that. February, if you have to bear root of Japanese maple is the easiest time to do it. And so I have customers who have three, 400 trees in their collection of containers. And what they'll do is in February, they'll pull those trees out. They'll either lightly root prune them to kind of, you know, on a lower level bones out of these trees by root prune them and putting them back in the same container, or they'll shift them up to a larger container at that point. So you've got either option, but you do want to be checking them at least every four to six years. Uh, you'll be surprised. My uncle had one in his garden, and he's like, I don't know what's going on with that Anabish Shadari. And I'm like, he probably gave you that thing like 15 years ago. It's been there a minute. So I go out there and pull it out, and I mean, there's like no soil left. It's like all root. There's like one little, and that's what tends to happen when we leave in the summer. We'll say it was doing so great for so many years, and then I left for two weeks, but the root ball had completely filled up that pot. So the, the pot was draining immensely faster than before. And you'll often have Japanese maples if you start to have different ones in containers. Some will be young and they won't be, have their pot filled out as much. And then your older ones that have filled out their pot more, you'll be watering and you'll notice as soon as you're watering, it's coming out the bottom, like immediately. And that's a good indicator that, hey, this winter I need to repot, either trim the roots and put it back in the same container, put it in a bigger container or put it in the ground. Now, containers, they do require care. If you don't want to have to care for one more frequently, you can always put it in the ground. Japanese maples are super easy to plant in the ground and really easy to grow once you put one in the ground. 
container is a way to extend your garden to your patio, your driveway, and add that extra flair. Uh, it's a great way to even add new dimensions in the garden. Like my mom, like I was talking about, he will, she will have uh, containers sitting out in the garden because she can put a blue container out there with a red Japanese maple that's just going to add extra contrast and give it a little more height. And she can keep certain Japanese maples at a smaller stature. And so there's so many fun ways to do that, but it does require more care. And if you're not willing to take that little extra care for a container, you can always take it and plant it. Now, Matt mentioned earlier about not bringing it indoors. That is critical. We have so many people who will bring it into a heated setting where the plant starts to get activated and leaf out. And that causes a lot of issues, especially if you put it back outside later when the threat of frost and stuff hasn't passed already. But whenever you have that, if you want to protect your Japanese maple in a container, the best thing you can do, put your containers together and then put some mulch around them. I mean, you can insulate that pot out there outside without having to bring it in. If you put it next to your house and bring it up close, often what people will do is they will put it where the, past the overhang and then the plant doesn't get any natural water. And it's something we all do, but then it happens and then we go back and look and say, well, what happened to this Japanese maple? Well, we sat it somewhere it didn't get natural water during the winter and it's essentially just dried out like it would during the summer because plants do need moisture during those winter months just like they do during the summer. Yeah, really easy to do. We've actually had this kind of nuke fun craze where, I don't know if we threw photos in or not, but a lot of our customers are growing weeping Japanese maples like this Ryusin in hanging baskets, almost like in lieu of ferns, which is kind of fun. In Japan, we saw them growing as a topsy-turvy, so they cut a hole out of the bottom and grew the tree unstaked, something like Ryusin, so it weeped down. And then there were these pots that were basically growing annuals on top of them and then cracking it after so long and planting it. And then this unstaked tree weeps the other way. So you get these really cool shapes when you play with things like that. Uh, Makawi Etsubusa over here in the far corner, that's a green during this time of the season. Some great fall color going on there. That one, because of its bonsai-like shape, always extremely popular for container gardening. One thing I always like to let people know too with container gardening, I'm always cautious, especially during this time of the year, in full sun. So if you're in a planter and you're in full sun, I typically give them shade even where we're at in zone 6B. People, like again, you'll go on vacation, everything's going great, but then that one year that root ball gets a little bit larger and it dries out so much faster than you're expected to. Uh, so typically in containers, shade is your best bet uh, just on your long-term health and growth. You can get by with it in the early spring, but you know they are mobile in containers. I try to get them back to some shade by this time of the year. So on all these plants, we tried to give you a little bit of things to check out, some cool plants. We've, if you notice, all of them have cultivar names on here as well. So as we're going through here, you can see that this is Purple Ghost. Um, and we're talking about watering. And there's not a lot of real exciting photos of, I mean, we could have us out there watering the plant, <laughs> but it's best just to show you all cool plants while we're talking about these. Uh, watering Japanese maples, this is one of the most critical things when it comes to it. And the, the number one thing that I would say is good drainage and consistency. Uh, basically, if you're out there and you're watering the plant all the time, that plant is going to think that it needs water all the time. And so it's not going to put out roots for getting water all the time because you're watering it constantly. If you water it and let it set out its roots and give it a little bit of time to put out its roots itself, it's going to become more efficient and take care of itself better for it, uh, for itself when you're gone. So it's one thing to consider whenever you're watering is, do I want to be watering this plant all the time and not let this tree put on a lot of roots? Or do I want to water it, let it dry out, and then water it, let it dry out, and then that plant's going to set out more roots and start taking care of itself more and more long term. Now, when we went to the woods with Nakata-san and studied how maples were growing, this was something that was really obvious to us. He, he took us out to these different areas and showed us, you know, native habitat, mostly Acer palmatum, subspecies palmatum. So a very basic small leaf green, very similar to what we graft to. Although every now and then you're walking around Japan, you see something variegated off in the woods and you about wreck the car because there's maples growing in the middle of the woods. But th there's all these cool plants and they're in areas where they have incredible drainage. They're on banks. They're even beside rivers, but they're in areas where they're getting watered and then drying out completely. So they're mimicking this process where the roots are going in search of moisture. They're not staying stagnant and wet. If you're, if you're having a Japanese maple, especially in the containers we mentioned earlier, they're staying stagnant and wet, you're gonna set up more root rot and you're gonna have more issues long-term. So a lot of time what I see when someone sends me a tree to diagnose what's going on, it almost sounds like a cop-out sometimes I know to people because they say, hey, what's going on with my leaf? It's normally around this time of the year. Kind of looks like you got hit with a lighter a little bit. And I'm like, well, you're either watering too much or too little. <laughs> it's probably too much, but they look similar. 
So if you're watering your Japanese maple too much, it starts to have this look like you got hit a little bit with a lighter. And oftentimes that's that tree giving you an indicator, hey, I'm staying too wet, things aren't going right, I'm starting to get a little stressed. And one of the best things about Japanese maples, I mean, it's kind of a fun thing they do, they're easy to reset. I mean, a Japanese maple gets stressed, it drops its leaves, you start doing things the right way, they relief back out. So they're a little easier than our conifer friends who when things go wrong, they're like, throw up the red flag, it's over. Japanese maples at least give us these indicators and then you can kind of fix the situation. So if it is staying too wet, you can kind of mend that. Now, too wet can surprise you. Like sometimes your neighbor will change something in their yard, you're, you've got an area that's holding more water than it did a previous season. I see it a lot. So just be cautious of that. And we let them dry out completely. Like I'll actually go out and put my hand in a pot and make sure it's dry before we let that water system kick back on if, we're, if it's an area where it's getting the overhead water. And that's really one of the best things is the finger test. Sometimes people will say, oh, well, I've got this device that measures the water. Often people misuse those devices this and get guy, bad readings. This guy calls it the diaper test. I have three kids, he has none. I don't know what diaper test that is. You, know? <laughs> you put your finger in the soil. I always heard you put the finger in the diaper to check. I'm like, that I ain't never how you check that a diaper at all. <laughs> Not in our house. But it's always best to check, put your finger in there and check and see, is this getting enough moisture? Now, often what we do is we think, hey, we had a lot of rainfall. This plant's got enough water. And that's not always the case. Rainfall can be very deceiving on how much is actually saturating the soil, especially on new plantings of plants that need more water. A young plant that's trying to get established will need more water because it doesn't have those roots set out establishing itself so it can take up moisture for it. A lot of times, plants that have recently been planted, especially with Japanese maples, you want to almost treat them like a container. They're, it's in the ground, but it's going to need more water in, until it actually gets its roots established out there in the landscape. And so, like I said before, the best thing to do is to water it, let it dry out, let it search roots out, and then it puts roots out so we can start taking up water and moisture more efficiently. But again, water from rainfall can often be very deceiving. We get rainfall, but it doesn't actually saturate the soil, especially with containers, and especially with plants that have a good canopy to them. A lot of Japanese maples that may be in a container that came from a nursery may have you know, a good amount of foliage up top that may actually be blocking the moisture from getting to the base. And if you don't go out there and water it, it may be dropping that foliage so then it can get moisture to that base and leaf back out again. Another thing we mentioned earlier, but be conscious of the plants you have around them. You know, oftentimes I'll see somebody and they'll say, I don't know what's wrong with my Japanese maples. And they'll send me a picture and I'll say, well, those annuals that you got all around the base are taking a lot of water. So you're watering very frequently to keep those happy. And that maple doesn't want to be that wet. So be conscious of that. Sometimes we can even put little plants around them. You don't want to kill your big, beautiful, expensive plant because of something that's requiring more water that may be next to it. So just be conscious of that as well. Uh, we hardly water that display garden you saw at all. So that display garden that has, gosh, a lot of trees in it now, they're very established. And one of the only years we watered was the year we were having all those fires in Western North Carolina. We, we re rarely ever require watering that garden once it's established. All right, let's get on to fertilizing. Uh, this is actually one of our selections from our Area 51 collection. It's part of our Heat Seeker series. It's an Acer Oliveranum hybrid of a Japanese maple. And this is the most heat tolerant yellow maple that's out there. Uh, it's one of our introductions. It sells out pretty quickly when we list it on Mr. Maple. Um, but this goes to a bright cherry red in the fall. Um, and that's just, I just had to mention that in there while we're talking about fertilizing because I love this plant. I named this one after my wife. It's called Hot Blonde. So I got a lot of extra credit when I named it that. Awesome yellow plant, and like Tim said, intense pink fall colors. Now, when you're fertilizing Japanese maples, we have to be conscious of what our objective is. So a lot of people will tell me, you know, I, I, I really don't want this tree to grow a lot. It's on the side corner. Uh, I, I've been using all these different fertilizers, and I'm like, wait, 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 wait. You, you really keep, want to keep the tree in this space. Why are you fertilizing? So sometimes it's best to not fertilize. J.D. Veritrees, who wrote the first edition of Japanese maples, recommends not fertilizing. And I think the reason he did that is to so that people wouldn't overdo it. And just like overdoing water, sometimes we can love our maples a little too much. Now, if you fertilize right, I actually do encourage you to fertilize, but doing, taking the right steps and in moderation is really the key. Now, a lot of those granulated mixes that you'll see, you know, Osmocote's the most popular one. Every gardener here uses Osmocote. You gotta be careful when you're putting it out. So if you're putting out Osmocote right now, it might be a 180 day release. You're keeping your tree way too active in those winter months. And that's where you see that splitting of the bark. A lot of times people won't even notice that until many years down the road, they'll say, I don't know what's going on. My Japanese maple split open at the base. 
Uh, I know last year, particularly in this area, it was a really brutal year on that, that December freeze. Uh, a, a lot of times you got to be very cautious. We're in Western North Carolina, so it's something we try to look at every single season. It's not uncommon for us to get into the 20s in October. So what we do is we cut off all of our granulated mixes, any of our granulated fertilizers after May. And that way we're not getting those 180 day releases, 120 day releases. You'll actually get better fall color if your trees aren't staying active, if they're shutting down. And you'll also get better winterization if your trees are not too active and they're shutting down. So that's gonna help a lot toward maintaining the health of the tree long term. I always let people know, you know, what gives Japanese maples a bad name is I could get a tree seven foot in a year, it just wouldn't winter too well. You know, you could get one really big with a lot of high nitrogen fertilizers, but that moderation and growing at a better pace is gonna give you a better tree. For instance, fish emulsion, that can make a tree grow really, really quickly. And you think, man, this tree is fantastic. What it does is it stretches out the cell walls of the plant and it stretches out the xylem, phloem, whatever takes the nutrients up, up the tree, that's what it's stretching out. And it's creating a situation where when you have a stress on the plant, high heat, cold, the arteries of that plant get clogged and frozen and bust really easy when you grow a plant uh, irresponsibly with too much nitrogen. Now people say, how much nitrogen is too much? Well, it varies. I mean, you could put 10, 10, 10 out and put a whole bag of 10, 10, 10 out and, and, and it'll over fertilize it. Uh, but the thing to do is something 15 or under and follow the bag's recommendations on, you know, if you're putting out a granular release. And like Matt said, make sure you're putting out early enough in the season that you're going to get uh, benefits in the spring flush. So right as it's leafing out, it's a great time to do it. Uh, but also make sure that you're not doing it too late in the season when, you know, every fertilizer bag you get has a time frame that it's actually releasing. And you need to look and see, is this going to be pushing when we're going into fall. One, you're not gonna get good fall colors because a tree that's really pushing a lot of new growth doesn't give as good a fall color. And then two, if you get a harsh winter, you're gonna have a lot of damage. So that's something to make sure is that you're not overdoing it, make sure that you're not over fertilizing. Uh, that's probably one of the bigger mistakes people make with Japanese maples. You, you won't see it until a few years down the road. I mean, you know, uh, master gardeners, a lot of people ask us questions. They'll say, I don't know what's going on here, this tree split. And that can happen sometimes with a really bad freeze like last year when it's just too hot, too cold. So what we try to do is prevent and, and be prepared for the changes. What you don't want are those extreme changes where you're going from 70 to 20 in a week. And, and that's inevitable really in Western North Carolina where we're at. That, that's called springtime in Western North Carolina. So we kind of prepare for that a little bit. And, and by not over fertilizing, we give them the best chance to, to ease through some of those weirder temperature changes. Now, liquid fertilizers can work pretty good late in the season if you need it. A tree needs a pickup. You again want to use moderation going late into the season with that. But liquid fertilizers don't leave as much residual nitrogen in the ground. Uh, and Tim mentioned 15 or lower on that nitrogen number. Uh, what we typically use is something around a 15, 8, 6 at our nursery. Uh, we kind of use it as a catch-all for a lot of different things. But the, the, the key is not really going too extreme. And then kind of following your instructions per. There's not an exact fertilizer I always recommend for maples, but moderation is definitely the key with that. Now, you may see Japanese maple fertilizer out there specifically sold as that. Often what I think that they're doing is they're selling you not enough fertilizer that really matters, charging you a lot of money for it, and throwing a Japanese maple name on it. And so do be wary of that. If it says Japanese maple fertilizer, often what that means is we're not going to give you much fertilizer because we don't want you to mess up on you it. You look at that nitrogen, we're gonna it's charge like you, a two or a four. We're going to give you less, you're we're going to make you pay more. <laughs> so do keep... Keep in mind that there are a lot of fertilizers out there that may be like a four, six, that's really not doing much. 10, 10, 10 is great. Uh, that's something that many people can get their hands on. Um, and that's an easy granular fertilizer that works very well. But often if you see a Japanese maple uh, label on there for your fertilizer, that, that typically means we're charging you more and we're giving you less. So I think it, Let's get into a little bit about pruning. Uh, this is a, a, a hot topic always with Japanese maples. Um, one of our customers wrote in our group, the hardest thing to do is to spank your kids and prune your Japanese maples. I was like, all right, I get it. Everybody's afraid. I have a customer, it's like we were cutting sawn off one of his trees, and every time we cut the tree, it's like it hurt him. It's like, oh, oh. I don't know if you all know Pearl Fryer. Pearl Fryer, famous for the topiary down in Bishopville, South Carolina, created these amazing topiary gardens. I went to visit Pearl Fryer one time. He said, that's the only tree in my yard my wife won't let me prune is that Japanese maple. She said, if I touch it, I'm, I'm done. So he creates all these amazing topiaries, but that was a tree that intimidated him. So 
Don't be afraid to prune Japanese maples, but we're going to give you the tips to when to do it and to do it at the right times. That's really the key. Now, there are two different times of the year when you can prune a Japanese maple, and one is when you want to do all of your major pruning, and that's mid to late March. That still applies here. Right before you leaf out is the easiest time to make major changes. Now, if you get 100 different nurserymen in the room, you're probably going to get 100 different answers on this. I can only give you my experiences and what works great for me and what I've been taught you know, by different Japanese nurserymen and, and other nurserymen. So people have different opinions on this. Japanese maples will have sap flow during early spring when you prune on them, but they heal so much quicker. As nurserymen, this is when we're going to graft because they heal right away. That, that, that healing period that's going to take you six, seven weeks and other times a year is going to happen a week. So it's easier to make changes. Now, good warning, if you're pruning in mid to late March, you're going to increase the vigor of your tree. So your tree is going to grow faster when you're pruning in mid to late March. That's actually when nurserymen prune for shape because we're increasing the vigor of the plant. It's actually going to, the root system is going to make up that difference and it's going to put on new growth right away from there. So you'll create a happier, healthier plant by pruning in mid to late March. Now you don't have to prune your Japanese maple. Again, if, you, if you're looking for a tree that's going to fit that corner and it's small and it's doing great there, maybe pruning isn't the right answer for what you're, you're trying to achieve with this tree. You can think about pruning almost like exercising. Whenever you prune this tree, it's going to grow, and it's going to, it's going to grow, and it's going to grow faster. And you're going to promote growth often when you prune. Now, with Japanese maples, they have, uh, they're, they're really easy to grow out in the landscape. But people often, when Matt was talking about late February, a lot of collectors will be worried because they say, my Japanese maple is bleeding because they see sap coming from the tree, and it scares them to death. But that is the ideal to, time to prune. Like Matt mentioned, it does heal very, very quickly. I mean, it'll heal in seven to eight days sometimes, ten, eight to ten days, where if you prune in the fall, which is when people are often thinking about pruning, it could take 35 days for it to heal during that time. And think about it. When you're actually pruning, what you're doing is you're making a surgical cut on this plant. One, you want to make sure that you're clean. So you want to make sure that you're using rubbing alcohol and cleaning your, pr your pruners. I mean, people are always going out to their garden pruning off dead things in their garden, and then they go to their Japanese maple and use that same saw, that same trimmers, and they don't clean their trimmers. You may be spreading something. There may be a reason why you're having different things die back around the garden, and you can actually spread things around your garden with unclean trimmers. So that's a big thing to watch out for when you're doing this. But also, whenever you're pruning your Japanese maple, that sap is going to flow. And you're going to want to make sure that you're doing that during the right time of the season so that plant heals because you don't want open wounds on that plant. I mean, if you, have an, if you have an open wound, do you want it to heal in seven days or do you want it to heal in 35 days? You've got a lot more issues with attracting bugs and other issues and possible catching diseases if you're keeping a wound for a long period of time. Now, spring is the optimal time for all major changes. So if you see big branches you don't like, don't be afraid to take them out. You're gonna put energy into the parts you do like of the plant. That's why we recommend doing that in spring. Now you can prune your trees in the bonsai method, which is in later in the summer, once the growth is hardened off. When you prune during this time of the year, you are actually taking energy away from the plant and you are creating a smaller plant. But I do caution against doing too much aesthetic pruning during this time. You wanna do your major changes during the spring and cosmetic pruning to keep it smaller during the late part of the summer. If you're, so if you're gonna trim late summer, keep it to a minimum. I was once, we were once in, uh, I believe it was, was it Home and Garden or Better Home and Gardens? I don't remember. We've been in a bunch of things, but they had my face there and they, they asked me for a couple of quotes. And then the piece that was right beside my head was, make sure to prune your Japanese maples going into fall. I'm like, oh man, I've never said that. I don't remember which magazine it was, but a lot of publications and a lot of experts will recommend this. The reason I like to avoid that, one, you're opening your trees up when all the insects are looking for places to go. You're, you're providing damage to the tree right when it's going through its dormancy. Uh, let it harden off, let it go through dormancy, let all those things occur naturally, let that fall color happen, wait until, you know, typically we say late February, mid to late March, depending on the area, but what you want is the sap to be starting to elevate in the tree, but the tree isn't in leaf yet. So it's that early spring right before they leaf out. We find that to be kind of the optimal time to make major changes. People will say, I want to prune my tree, I want to change it, and they'll send me a picture of it, and they'll say, look what I did, and I'll say, go back and prune it when you're angry, because it doesn't look like you did anything. So when you do it at the right time, don't be afraid to make major changes. We have a whole video on aesthetic pruning on our website. Uh, it's doing really well. It's one of our best videos we've ever done. It's almost 100,000 views. But if you want like a step-by-step -step tutorial, it's a great way to go follow that one. We're going to do one this uh, next year on pruning 
a lace sleeve. So you can get as detailed as you want. The next thing I would tell you to, to kind of focus on when you're pruning a Japanese maple is find out what that tree's supposed to do and replicate that. You don't want to be turning a blood good that's going to get 30 feet into a lace leaf. You're going to lose that battle. So go and look at what your tree's supposed to do cultivar wise. Our website's a great resource for information. But if you're growing something that's like a wonderful Makawi Etsubusa, this shape, you can do things to accentuate what you like about that tree and what it's going to do naturally. So you don't have to fight the nature of that tree in your pruning. And once you know kind of what it's going to do, just let the tree guide it. It's going to kind of give you the steps to what you need. Take out twiggy growth in the spring. That's going to throw on a ton of growth as well. But super simple to do and don't be intimidated to do it as long as you're doing it at the right time in the right way. And our good friend, Buddy Lee, who found the Encore Azalea, and I mean, he's got so many amazing plants. I mean, I wish, I wish we had that plant patent because he's probably doing well there. That's a good one. <laughs> That's a good one to have. <laughs> but he, he always says when you're pruning, you always want to prune with the azaleas when you want to fertilize. And so many the, woody ornamentals. Yeah, and, and that's the way, same way with Japanese maples. You don't want to prune it going into the fall because when you do prune, you do get growth that comes out after that. So you're often encouraging growth and encouraging the plant to do growth and healing. And so again, if you're doing it in the fall, that's just the wrong time. You're kind of waking them up at the, the wrong time of the season, just like that fertilizer. So behind us, that's Acer Palmatum Celebration. That is an amazing plant. It's going to get 8 to 10 foot in 10 years, and it gives you unreal pink colors. It's got that reticulated ghost-like variegation where you see the veins in the leaf. Pretty awesome plant. The, the photos on each slide are why you should care about Japanese maples. <laughs> exactly. And the writing is the care for Japanese maples. So. so late frost and cold snaps. We always get questions about what do I do about my Japanese maples, and there's two different things. There's a late frost and then there's a cold snap, and we'll explain the difference. A late frost is the plants in leaf, and it's going to get in the 30s. And then your plant is, you know, susceptible to actually getting frost on the foliage. And this is a bad thing, but it's not a horrible thing. I mean, Japanese maples will respond back to that. And so if this happens, there's some things to do first off. Go out, give your plant some liquid miracle grow, and remember to water it and let it dry out, and water it and let it dry out. Because that plant has damaged foliage, and you want to give it nutrients and energy so that it can recover and it can heal and it can push on new growth. So first, I want, before we go any further, I just want to tell you what to do if you do get that frost on there. But there are some preventative me measures you can take and you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Yeah, oftentimes when we know we're having a late freeze, which again is every year in Western North Carolina, we will go out and put bed sheets around our trees, things like that if we know we're having a particularly late freeze where we're already in leaf and then we're getting below 24, for an extended amount of time. Typically, we don't really start heating until we know we're in the lower 20s for about eight hours in our greenhouses and we're in leaf. And that, that's really our cutoff. We get negative 10 where we're at. So we're not afraid to get negative 10. We just want them to be dormant when they're negative 10. Now, don't be afraid of the cold snaps going into winter. Every, every fall, people call me and they go, hey, it's frosting on my trees. And I'm like, hey, great. That's what it should do. We want them shutting down, going dormant. As long as you're not actively pushing that new growth, you know, those fall freezes and cold snaps, they're just going to be shutting them down. So you want that. That's actually going to help prevent more shock if we're having one of those freezes like we did in December of last year. There was a weird polar vortex. The more shutdown we can get our trees going into that, the better our chances are of it ex ex surviving an extreme condition. Now, if we're making sure that we're not fertilizing too early in the season, we're making sure that we're not fertilizing too late in the season, this plant, whenever often, will be on the timing that nature is. But nature doesn't always agree with us. And so... Sometimes that yard that you see at my parents' house, we've made that look like a ghost town. <laughs> and we sheets. take bed sheets around and we'll cover it up with bed sheets. Now, people will often say, I don't have enough of this and I'm just going to use trash bags. Whoa, like, we're, we're, we're making a big problem right there. When you start using plastic and not breathable material, you're often trapping the moisture on the foliage and you're going to create an even worse situation where that tree is going to struggle and you're gonna cause a lot of frost on the interior side of that bag on those plants. And you have to be careful with this. Uh, you can go out there and put bed sheets all around the plant and trying to be protected from a frost, and you get rain the morning, the night of, and then you're basically trapping it onto the plant. One so, great thing is if you know you're having frost is if you're having a good bit of wind. Now it's gonna blow all your bed sheets off that you put out the night before, but wind breaks up a lot of that ice. So wind's your friend if you know you're having a heavy frost. 
that's typically one of the best things you can see in the forecast when you see those temperatures dropping is a good amount of wind. Now, cold snaps, like Matt was talking about, that is a little bit different. When you start getting down to in the 20s and you're like, hey, this is 25 degrees and these plants have been in leaf for a while, what do I do? Well, bring in your containers first off. Go ahead and bring those containers in. They're movable. That's one of the great things about having trees and containers is you can bring them into your garage and that, that puts a little bit of safety net on those just for that short period of time. And I'd bring those in, the ones that have leafed out or the ones that have already had leaves starting to come out on them. Um, but the ones that, you know, hadn't leafed out, just leave them out there. They should be fine. Now, on the other side of things, the plants that are leafing out in your garden, what do you do about those? Well, the best thing you can do is try to put some sheets around there, try to add some heat in there. What you don't want to do is go and put a pot over top of it and put a light underneath it. What you'll often do is you'll actually cook the plant in that pot. So, you know, a light sometimes may work sometimes underneath a sheet, but if you're putting it under something plastic, even if it's not touching the plant itself, you're going to cook that plant. So be very wary because a frost and a cold snap is essentially dehydrating the plant. And the one thing you don't want to do after a late cold snap or a late frost is not water and take care of your plant after the fact. Now that can actually help a good bit too, you know, when you have, and again, that was a detrimental vortex last December here. It happened all across the South. But once your trees get to go through those extreme changes, water them once you're back above freezing. Now I know it was a soaking rain before that, so everything was soaked. So it's not always the optimal situation, but oftentimes after those cold freezes, normally that's when they're at their driest and actually watering a tree and then letting the water, you know, go through and drain well is going to give it a little bit more recovery even in those winter months out of leaf, it's gonna, it's gonna help a ton. Now, stressed Japanese maples, we can tell you some very simple things. Stressed Japanese maples may be ones that got hit with the frost. They may be ones that have, you know, got, you went on vacation and they dropped their leaves. What do I do? Make sure you've got good drainage first off, because you don't want to exacerbate any situations of overwatering. But use Liquid Miracle Grow. It's your best friend. And you can use Liquid Miracle Grow later on in the season when you can't use your, uh, so, you know, your granular fertilizers. Often those granular fertilizers, they are in the soil and they take a long period of time to release. The liquid fertilizers are much quicker. So you can use them later on in the season, but you still have to be conscious that, hey, I don't want to fertilize too late in the season and this plant not shut down with flushes of growth coming back. Now, one great thing about maples, like I said, they will drop leaf to let you know something's going wrong. There's no, there's no like, I don't know why my wife's angry at me with a Japanese maple. You find out real quick because things go wrong, the foliage drops. It, it, it's, but one great thing about Japanese maples too, or this time of the season specifically, there's a lot of healthy buds behind there and those buds are set in. You may not completely re-leaf out during this time of the season if you stress one. They may go, we're close enough to fall, we're just calling it a day, <laughs> we're done for the season. But those buds are there, and as long as you have healthy buds, you've got a healthy Japanese maple. So that's something you can always look to. Once you see the bud formation, even if you've dropped a leaf completely, your, your tree can bounce back. It, it's in good health. Now, this tree on the uh, photo here, this is Acer Palmatum Golden Falls. This is actually a newer weeping selection of a golden Japanese maple. And once it's established, it can handle the sun fairly well for some of the weeping types that's yellow. I love yellow plants. So you'll see a lot of Japanese maples on this presentation that's yellow. They add a lot of color and show a lot of color throughout the landscape. So transplanting Japanese maples. Uh, Matt, you want to start on transplanting Japanese maples? Yeah, the key there is timing. So you don't want to be planting, transplanting your Japanese maples when they're in leaf. Uh, again, the most forgiving time of the year is normally that early spring when you can do the pruning February through mid to late March before when they leaf out. That's typically when they're at their most forgiving. That's when that root ball is its most rejuvenative stage. Now, when you're going to dig a Japanese maple, you're going to disturb There's the roots. There's going to be transpiration if you're doing that. Now, can you transplant a Japanese maple in August and make it live? Sure. Yeah, I could drive home on my feet, but it ain't a good idea. Like, we want to give you the best success rate. So doing it in that mid to late March to even late February, you're going to disturb less of the roots. There's going to be less transpiration, and you're going to get the best success rate on that tree leafing back out, thriving and looking awesome. Sometimes you don't have a choice. You know, you're moving, you gotta get this tree transplanted. You wanna keep as much root ball intact as possible. You don't wanna be disturbing that root ball, especially in leaf. They'll go through a little bit of transplant shock sometimes uh, if you're moving one, especially an older, well-established tree. 
You can take some steps like going out with a spade and stamping around that tree if you know you're going to be moving it, kind of getting that root ball tucked in a little bit more, making it a smaller root ball over time because you know next February you're going to move it. That's a great way to do it. Even on a really established tree, I try not to completely bare root it. So dad calls it digging a donut. I'll dig a trench around the tree and keep the root ball intact. So I kind of continually dig a trench until I have a really nice root ball intact. And keeping that root ball intact is just going to make things easier on that transplant. Now, I know that our time's coming up, but we've got top five problems. We're going to go through these pretty quickly, and then we'll have our question time after that. This is going to be our top five problems that we see with Japanese maples. And we get emails constantly. We've got phone calls for years on all the issues people see with Japanese maples. And we know, say, we're not Dr. Maple. This is Mr. Maple. Just kidding. <laughs> we, don't say, we don't say that. But there's, there's some things we want to just throw out there because there's, these are the common mistakes we constantly see with Japanese maples. So this one, people, people laugh under some of our YouTube videos. They're like, really, weed eaters? Duh, that doesn't happen. Like, one of my favorite trees in my garden got killed by a weed eater. Not by me. I had a guy who was weed eating. He was practiced not to get near it, sent his buddy to do it one day, got too close to it and stripped it. So it's something we see very frequently. Keep weed eaters away from the bases. Once you've you know, kind of killed that, that circumference around the tree, you kind of need to go put some tree coat back on there because it's going to cause some long-term damages if you strip that bark. And sometimes you don't even realize it for a while until you start to see the effects and then it's easy to know it was a weed eater damage. And one way you can prevent this is one, talk to people who are weeding in your yard, say, hey, watch out for this tree. But there's another way you can do it. Take tomato cages, put them out there and basically put a tomato cage around there so they can't get close to it in the begin with. And if you take these little steps and as that plant gets established, it's going to be easier and easier for them to miss it because they're going to notice it. That also just helps animals get used to it. If you've got dogs, they might run out and bump into a very young plant, run over. And if you put a tomato cage around it, it often signifies to people and plants, hey, I'm not going to trip over this plant because it's a young one gallon. Or, hey, I'm going to keep some distance around from this when they're weed eating. Often the best thing to do is to tell your weed eater people, hey, when you get close to that Japanese maple, just reach down and pull the weeds around the edge of it. I mean, it's real simple. It's often people who are trying to get in a hurry that get your trees with the weed eaters. And it's, you know, everybody with the greatest intentions, hey, I'm going to get these weeds knocked out of here. Uh, but they're just stripping the base around your tree. And if you strip the base all the way around your Japanese maple, unfortunately, it doesn't have any other thing way to get nutrients to the top part. And so it'll often die. And so that's one of the biggest things that we see with Japanese maples. Weed killer. Now, this is another one that people are like, duh, I never do that. No one's ever sprayed weed killer in my yard. I've never had that happen. And then they send you a picture of it and like all the grass around the tree is brown. You're like, hmm, somebody sprayed weed killer around this tree. So be cautious of that. Be careful with that. Drift can be an issue. You only can spray weed killer above certain temperatures, above certain temperatures too. It'll aerate and, and, and float a little bit. So be very careful with that. It is tricky. There's you know, weed killers are designed to kill a plant, so it is hard once it's on the plant to recover it. Sometimes you can wash the tree, you can get the soil uh, cleaned up around it, and you can recover it. But it is something we see quite frequently. Uh, it, unfortunately, people will do it around high graft lace leaves because they assume that standard protects it somehow. So they'll spray around the roots. I had at a doctor locally, and somebody wiped about 15 very old established lace leaves out in his garden because they were spraying around the base of it, and they were on standards. So it looked like, you know, it was on this, you know, high rise up here, but the roots still factor in. So be careful with weed killers. And we have a full in-depth uh, podcast on this, too. It's our murder mystery podcast, which is who <laughs> killed the Japanese maple. Had to get on that murder mystery and, trend. Really. And so we go through and it's talk about all the different ways Japanese maples can, that can die. And unfortunately, the number one way is the people that are trying to take care of them from overloving them or some way. But weed killer is often done by someone's spouse. That's what we always hear on the other side. Oh, my, my husband did it. Oh, my wife sprayed some weed killer out there. No one ever did it. And then they're like, wait a second. Now, we did have that guy spray weed killer last week. But that's what I thought. There are some things. There's timing of weed killer. Really pay attention to the directions. If you put it out when there's a little bit of wind, just a little bit of gust, it can have a drift and drift over to your Japanese maple, not even where you sprayed it. And if you're spraying it when it's above, I believe it's 90 something degrees on certain ones, check the label, it can actually turn into a gas and raise up and hit the plants above it. And that's one of the things we often see is people putting it out, staying away from their plants, but 
it turning into a gas and they're putting it at the wrong time of the, uh, just the wrong time, the wrong heat, the wrong amount of wind, and it's really affecting the Japanese maples because of that. And that's just something to be very, very conscious of is watch out for the wind drift and watch out for the temperature because often people put out weed killer when it's hot in the summer, but you gotta watch it because it can then turn into a gas and affect your plants. And you're not gonna pay much attention to the annual over here that cost you 250, but your Japanese maple costs you a little bit more. And that's gonna be the thing that you're like, it died, what happened? And unfortunately, a lot of times it's weed killer. So check out this plant over here, that one, the backslide one, that's Acer Palmatum Firefly. That's when we named it our nursery. Another really cool variegated with that reticulated veining in there. Just a cool Japanese maple I wanted to point out. Okay, so number three is the volcano of death. This is that mulch when you see landscapers and instead of removing the mulch from before, what they do is they just keep piling mulch. And with shallow non-invasive root, rooted plants like a Japanese maple, you're gonna smother those roots and you can kill your Japanese maple. I've taught classes at UT, Auburn, NC State, no, I've never seen one professor teach the volcano of death, but somehow it's still happening. They'll pile the, the, the mulch up around the tree until it just covers the base of it. It's up about a foot. That's a surefire way to smother your Japanese maple. We talked a little bit earlier about, you know, not planting too deep. The volcano of death, make sure to avoid that. Even if you have people installing trees, you see the volcano of death, just go out there and say, we got to take care of this right away. Number two is over fertilizing. We've already covered that a lot with the fertilizing side of things. But if you're over fertilizing with too much fertilizer, you're gonna cause it to stress out in the droughts and you're gonna cause it to stress out during those cold snaps, during the cold times during the winter. And also it's just not gonna be shut down. Not only will the cell walls be stretched out and not ready to be able to go through these uh, stresses, they are also going to be uh, too active and they can freeze and bust. And number one, we'll beat it like a dead horse. Good drainage. You gotta have good drainage on Japanese maples. We started out with this, but it is the paramount thing with Japanese maples. Uh, if you don't have good drainage, Japanese maples aren't gonna be happy. That's just the bottom line. And like we talked about before, there's many ways you can do this. You can put a tree in a container, grow it out there on bricks out there in that area if it's raised up. Create a raised bed that, that raised raises bed. the whole area. There's a lot of ways to add drainage. You can add a lot of soil to that area to you know, make sure that water's flowing elsewhere. And it's just such an important thing with the Japanese maple. They wanna get wet and they wanna dry out. And this sounds, you know, you've heard us say this many times, but this is the number one reason why Japanese maples die is someone putting them somewhere where they're just constantly staying wet and not able to dry out. Really cool Acer picked them here. This is Hoshi Adori. It's got that splash as a green. In early spring, it'll be yellow on dark green. Re really showy picked them. Yeah, and it's a batwing maple. So it has these larger foliage. I mean, the foliage on this is like this big. And so it really gives a really large palette to display that variegation. And uh, the batwing maples are some of our favorite maples. They're really fun and really different. So and we've talked a lot about everything that can go wrong. Uh, there's a lot that can go right. Maples are really simple. It is one of those trees that the ones that look the worst are the ones that get too much love. The one that gets planted out beside the walkway and kind of forgotten about. Oftentimes that's the one that's looking great because it kind of just got established and it's doing its own thing. The one's getting too much fertilizer, too much water and too much attention can overstress a little bit. Uh, if you want to learn more about cultivar Japanese maples, this talk was a lot on care for Japanese maples. Sign up for our weekly emails. We do 10 new trees every single Tuesday at 10. So there's always something new coming there on Mr. Maple as well. And we often get people asking us about pests with Japanese maples. They're typically not as big of an issue if you follow all these, because if you have a plant that is stressed out there in the landscape, they attract a lot more pests. Now we do have videos on our YouTube channel on how to deal with aphids, how to deal with spider mites, how to deal with a lot of the common issues that people see with Japanese maples, and Japanese That can beetles. change a ton per area too. So that, that can be very different for us versus y'all, you know, versus Memphis. So it can change a lot in terminally the past each area. But it's something to be wary of is you have a plant that's stressed out there in the landscape, it's gonna attract more pests. So if you're overwatering your plant, you're gonna get more pests and have a lot more issues with your Japanese maple. Um, if you can avoid you know, those stresses and help your plant when it does go through the stresses, say it gets a, a late frost on it, giving it liquid miracle grow, get it in a growing stage again, where it's really pushing on growth again, you're gonna have less issues with spider mites. If you don't do that, you may get a lot of pests that come in trying to attack the plant because that plant is releasing hormones that basically says, I'm stressed out. 
and that's going to attract a lot of plants into it. You're going to get more plants that are stressed that may get munched on by deer or a rabbit. So if you see that happening, think about, hey, is there something else going on here, or is this just a casual walk by and a taste? And again, uh, this is actually where we hiked up Gregory Bald. If you all know where Gregory Bald is, any of you all know where that's at? It is going up in Cades Cove. You go up one of the back roads. This is about a 10-mile hike we did, and we went up and did a whole video on the swarm of native azaleas that's growing up there on Gregory Bald. So you also go check that out. It's a, a really fun video. We're standing there with Del Barong, former president of Maple Society, but he's real active in the Azalea Society as well.